Hello, everyone, and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Hal Avinka, and I'm the event director at the bookstore, and I'm absolutely thrilled today to be collaborating again with our friends at NYRB to welcome back Amit Chaudhuri live from Calcutta for a discussion of his new book, Finding the Raga, an improvisation on Indian music in conversation with Ben Ratliff. While the pandemic has taken a toll across all of our lives, virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become bright spots in our days. And I want to give a huge thanks to our guests for joining us tonight, uh, and especially to Amit for bearing a very early morning to be here. Uh, so thanks again. So to some housekeeping before we get started, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button here at the bottom of the screen to submit them. We'll be asking those at the end of the program. There's also a chat button here at the bottom through which I'll be posting a link to purchase tonight's book if you haven't already. A caveat for tonight's event, we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads, so please bear with any technical issues that could arise. We will try to solve them quickly. And finally, we've scheduled a whole host of spring programming, so head over to our website and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. Two that I want to mention uh, next Tuesday, April 20th, we're excited to be working with the New York Review of Books magazine team for a panel entitled Fiction in a Time of Crisis featuring Valeria Luiselli, Ben Lerner, Ayad Akhtar, and Dinam Mengestu. And later that week, our series with NYRB Classics continues with translator Robert Chandler joining us for a discussion of his newest translation of Teffy Stories. Uh, those programs are on our website now and taking registrations. So now a little about tonight's guest and we will get started. Ahmed Chaudhuri is the author of seven novels, including most recently, Friend of My Youth. Among his other published works are collections of short stories, poetry, and essays, as well as the nonfiction Calcutta, and a critical study of D.H. Lawrence's poetry. He has received the Commonwealth Writers' Prize, the Betsy Trask Award, the Encore Prize, among many other accolades. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and holds the titles of Professor of Contemporary Literature at the University of East Anglia in England and Professor of Creative Writing at uh, Ashora, uh, or excuse me, Ashoka University in India. Uh, and Ben Ratliff is the author of books including Every Song Ever, 20 Ways to Listen in an Age of Musical Plenty, and Coltrane, The Story of a Sound. He was a pop and jazz critic at the New York Times from 1996 to 2016 and at New York University's Gallatin School of Individualized Study. So, turning the stage over to you. Hi, Amit. Hi. 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 I think we're we're very lucky that you came ready to perform, and all uh, mic'd up and EQ'd. Um, yeah. I think maybe we should just start with music. Yeah, sure. Um, so this is the first time I've, I've done something like this online and uh, uh, for a, for a program that's that's about a book. Um, but since this book is about music. Um, um, so we've all agreed that it might be nice to have some music. And this was planned well before, you know, we thought that the, the pandemic would still be sort of going on uh, at this time. Uh, expected this to have been a live performance or at least um, that we'd been in, in the same time zone. But since we aren't in the, in the same time zone, it means that I'm in India, in Calcutta, and it is getting to be 20 to 6 in the morning. You can see the light come up. It comes up quite early in the east of India, which is where we are. So I'm going to sing a rag, just give you a little taste of it, you know, um, no more than four or five minutes. Um, called Nut Bhairav, it's getting to be time to singing this, to be able to sing this rag. Um, that's so it's going to be in 16 beats uh, medium fast tempo 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 1 that's the cycle and nut bhairav which is a mix of one could say two rags bhairav and chaya nut chaya nut is a nighttime rag and bhairav is a morning rag so this is a, an early morning rag it has a it has seven notes. The sixth note is a flat. Um, so, yeah, not higher. Yeah. I'm using the electric tanpura and electric tabla, which have been made ingeniously by people in Bangalore. Usually I use them to practice with when I travel, but I'm using them today because it's difficult to get human beings to play tabla and other instruments with me at this time of day. <laughs> Not by <rough. sighs> 
नया खैरो पार करो नया खैरो पार करो बार घर नया घरो बार करो नया घरो पार नया करो बार नया खर करो पार करो नया करो पर नया करो पार नया नया करो पार मोर कर तार नया करो पार नया करो बार नया करो पार करो मैया करो मार करो बार करो आम आम करो बार करो बार करो पार करो पार नया करो पार करो नया करो नया करो पार नया करो पार मोर करम तार नया करो पार नया करो भार करो पार घरो नया करो बार नया घरो पार करो बार नया करो पार नया करो पार नया पार करो नया करो नया करो बार नहीं नया करो बार बोर नया करो बार बोर कर तार नया करो पार सगम पा बाबा 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 नी दा I think I should end it here. Thank you. Um, can you can you tell us about the contents of what you just sang? Um, so I sang a a kind of composition which has words in it. The words uh, are sort of they have de devotional content. Naya karo par more kartar Lord. Um, you know, reach my my vessel, my canoe, to the other side. Um, but because the the words are also used for improvisatory progression in the rag, the words kind of gradually begin to lose meaning. They're also also used to come back to the one of the time cycle, um, and because the time cycle is being sort of observed and also played with and because the words are you know being used for uh, uh, the exploration of the rag uh, the words begin to lose the kind of centrality of meaning that they would have if this were just a conventional song um, as you could tell i mean the tabla was playing the the the, the beat the time cycle of 16 beats at this tempo of four beats times four equals to 16 one time cycle one two three four five six seven eight nine so one two three four one two three four one two three four one two three four that's the that was the time cycle here for this tal called teen tal um however uh, you would have probably noticed that when I was sort of exploring the rag, I was moving from the lower octave to the upper. And 
at the time of ex exploration, I was um, I was not singing in that four four time. I was singing in free four uh, in free time, and I would just return to the four four whenever I had to come back to the one with the words of the composition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So th um, that that's th that's a basic kind of introduction to what I was trying to do here with these machines. <laughs> There's a passage in this book where there's actually several passages in this book where you talk about practice you talk yeah. about the 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 idea of riyaz yeah or practice in north indian classical music and um you have this great line you say riyaz is an intervention in the artist's feeling of discontinuity right and you're making the point that when you write a novel or a poem or an article or whatever you get the, the thing is finished and it gets out there in the world and after a little while you you, you don't really feel connected to it anymore it's almost as right. if somebody else wrote it but yeah. your daily practice of singing and being an, a musician is what kind of is the thread for your life right. um, so I have lots of questions about that but the first thing would be is what you just did your daily practice. I mean, if we weren't meeting all together here, would you be doing something similar at 5.30 in the morning? No, I, firstly, I wouldn't be awake at 5.30. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I'm a, I'm a, I sleep late, I wake up kind of uh, late. I mean, um, not, not very late, but, but I don't certainly not awake at 5.30. So I wake up and then I practice. But what I practice is, is, is the more expansive uh, slow tempo khayal the film with i mean here I, I was quite aware that you know i didn't have much time and i was al already overrunning my five minutes you know when i was singing uh, but i had barely time to sort of warm up and get into the into the rug as it were you know mm. it can be done i mean people have recorded three minute ragas and khayals for 78 rpm records uh, in the early days of recording uh, and done it wonderfully but in in a live performance usually you you're waiting to 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 kind of expand on the rag familiarize yourself with it um a, a, and and explore it it's my new chef uh, uh, with much more time in hand and and uh without a sense of hurry and and uh, this is what begins in the morning you just spend a lot of time firstly um, exploring the lower notes for instance and and and, and the ways in which you, you know you can take your time even getting to the lower tonic yeah yeah and then then you know that you I, I practice for an hour in the morning so so y y you see I mean I spend about half an hour doing what I did right now in what about Four minutes, five minutes. I don't know how long yeah. I took. Yeah. Um, would you like to read a bit from the book? Sure. We so, were talking um, about a passage that had something to do maybe with time or Raga's relationship to time, or maybe it was a passage about what is Raga. Yeah. I can't remember. Right. So here I am... Um, talking about the way the rag, rag is related to the world it's a, a, a rag is sung at a particular time of day as you could see I took the opportunity of it being early morning here to sing Nad Bhairav which I generally would not get a chance to sing in public um, or even at this time of day so there is a relationship between the rag and the light that's happening outside and some some rags are also related to this, to this to various seasons. You know that there, there are season seasonal rags, rags of the monsoons, rags of of springtime. So um, I, I was long intrigued by the fact that the rag is related so deeply to the world, but doesn't actually, in a, in a traditional narrative or representational sense, evoke the world. So over here I was. Um, distinguishing the rag 
from let's say uh, Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, the Pastoral Symphony, where you know um, spring, the spring is evoked, a storm is evoked, and it's evoked. These things are evoked through kind of notes, yeah, um, modes, uh, uh, the way the music is paced. Um, I'm looking at a, at a different way of a rag or, or a piece of music or any form of art uh, being related to the world, a deep relationship. A secular relationship, in the end, it's not uh, prescribed by religion or, you know, uh, other, uh, other kind of prescriptions. It, it's, it's really, it's, it's arisen from the culture, this, this relationship. So I wanted to it, 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 I wanted to investigate, and this is what what I'm uh, writing about over here. Uh, the rag is not about the world; it's of it. Once you know the rag, the world and it can't be independent of each other in the way it's impossible to grasp the physical universe outside of the language in which we think and feel. As the rag is of the world. Its primary space isn't a concert space or even the temples and courts in which it once unfolded. It's situated really in a time of day or season. And, in contrast to how we experience music in a concert hall, a significant leakage in both directions is allowed. The ragas into the world, the worlds into the raga. For this reason, every sound bird call, a car horn, a cuff, is continuous with its textuality and texture. I probably first began to notice the everyday as a 17 or 18 year old through Indian music's reordering of my idea of what a relationship with my surroundings comprised. As a result of the situatedness, a rag that's sung at a time of day it's not meant for is subjected in the critic Raghav Menon's words, to jet lag. The metaphor of intercontinental travel emphasizes the textuality of North Indian classical music. When I practice the morning rag Tori in Oxford, I feel an incompatibility. This is because the morning in Oxford is not only a different reality, it's a different language. The problem of making Tori fit is a translational one. I'm not claiming that the rag belongs organically to the Indian landscape. I'm saying that while language is local and provisional, it's also how we experience the universe. As, you Hindu, as Hindustani classical music reminds us, India is text. Only a relatively small bit of reality can be conveyed by narrating stories about it or representing it in pictures. We participate in reality by experiencing language at its most arbitrary basic level of meaning. Kedar is evening, Bhairav is morning, evening is the time that occurs before night. This constant embrace of language is how we elect to live in the world. The singer is reminded of this every time they sing a rag. One also concedes that a culture that privileges narrative and representation also privileges the author who gives birth to the piece of representation, as with Beethoven. A culture that gives primacy to language, as with, North Indian classic, with the North Indian classical music tradition, will relegate the composer to secondary or invisible status and see text as the primary progenitor. This is why most ragas have no known composers and who the composer might be is of secondary interest. What is a rag? The question can be approached in many ways and I'll restrict myself for now to the context I've established of Indian music as text or language. The rag has no more an absolute identity than a word does. Ferdinand de Saussure's claim that language is a social fabric marked by difference is especially true of rags. There's nothing about the word bat for example, then makes it intrinsically refer to that animal. Bat, as in the case with other words, is not an absolute. It's a sign and a sound, a 
that's related to all the similar sounds and signs it is not, like bed or bud or but. This is what socio means by difference, the way language and its meanings are formed by negative differentiations. Similarly, evening means what it does not because it has an automatic link with that time of day. But be- sorry, similarly, evening means what it does not because it has an automatic link with that time of day, but because its sound distinguishes itself from other sounds that have different meanings, avenue and awning, for instance. Dehida in recognition of Socio's insight that the word isn't born with an eternal fixed identity co- poetically calls this lack of fixity, this residue of one sound in another, a trace. You do a, um, you do a process of elimination which helps us to understand what the raga isn't. Um, you know, you say it isn't a composition, it isn't a melody, it isn't a scale, it isn't a mode, it isn't um, what, what, we, what, what we may hear as improvisation perhaps isn't. Um, and I find something similar about your book. Uh, it, it isn't a memoir per se, it isn't ethnomusicology, it isn't instructional. Um, it isn't. It isn't completely criticism, or it is and isn't all of those things. I, I wonder if you were thinking about this, this this type of thing as you as you were writing it. Not consciously. I I, I definitely uh, didn't want to write any of those things that that you just mentioned. I mean, um, simply because I I, I I wouldn't be capable of writing. Um, um, a, a, a straightforward introduction or ethnomusicology or a memoir in which I somehow relegate uh, my thoughts and thought processes about music and khayal to, to, to kind of a summary of a few sentences. Um, so I wanted to give myself um, space and time to, to be able to do all these things, but not in a way uh, that would be compartmentalized in the sense that this bit, this bit is about my life. That bit is yeah. about Western music. That bit is about Indian music. So um, this kind of um, moving between things um, uh, comes kind of to me as the only way of, of, of practicing what I do, uh, whether it's writing uh, fiction or essays. Um, and it, it allows me to reach... Uh, a, 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 since we're talking about criticism, it allows me to reach kind of ideas, critical ideas about something, uh, let's say in this case, Indian, Indian classical music, which I just simply would not be able to do, arrive at, uh, paradoxically, if I was just writing a straightforward piece of academic criticism. I would not be able to arrive at these ideas without having uh, made these journeys in different directions. It's only by making these journeys in, in, in these various different directions that I can arrive at each one of these places in a way that I cannot if I, I, if I stick to genre. So I'd have to sacrifice a lot uh, if I wrote you know, the straightforward book of one kind or another. Mm-hmm. Well, and this mode of writing may, may suit the subject or it may, and it may also just be you. I mean, you, you talk about how in your, in your novels, um, you like novels that don't stick to a story or don't, or don't uh, prioritize tell- uh, the narrative. Um, you, like, um, you like introductions. You talk about liking deferral and, you, and that's something that you find tr- true to the nature of Raga. Right. Um, so as far as m- m- my fiction is concerned, I, I find that um, I come from, again, this kind of place which I might share with other people, but I, I, I need to articulate it clearly. Uh, and that place is that, um, for me, personally speaking, narrative suppresses life. I'm interested in life. And uh, narrative and its syntax of representation 
uh, in in fiction for me uh, seems to keep life at bay while while purporting to kind of uh, document it represent it encompass it and uh, it's what's on the margins of narrative that i find to possess life to be full of life which is why in fiction i'm always drawn away from narrative towards on the margins of narrative um and in music it's just a coincidence that i've been sort of drawn to a form uh which is not about a straightforward theme or development uh, but is about um delaying that development and and prevaricating upon the development so if the development comprises the straightforward form of a of a rag uh prevarication is where uh, let's say khayal the, the the word which is the name of this form that i was singing uh prevarication is where it's it's kind of um imaginative contribution lies i mean so khayal also means is the arabic word incorporated here in urdu and hindi uh, the, uh, the arabic word for the imagination which it also could mean a thought a whim um so so uh, but this form uh, uh, is it, it basically enshrines a form of development that is also a prevarication upon development and it's the prevarication that's being delighted in by the listener and the and 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 the and of course the musician mm-hmm. so the musician doesn't want to come straight to the point because that would be a a kind of um diminishing of the imaginative possibilities of what they can do yes yeah i see you um you talk so you you began um you began singing this kind of music when you were what was it 16 17 something like that 16 yeah when i was 16 that was when you had your first teacher right right mm-hmm. my first teacher uh, govind prasad jaipur wale yeah but at the time you were still singing um sort of folk rock music <laughs> right um and you talk about sort of imagining yourself as a as a kind of a canadian folk singer I was on my way to becoming a Canadian singer songwriter. Yeah. Yeah. So was it a categorical shift that you made or do you think that um I mean was it was it a, an absolute shift of some, of um was it a complete break from something to something else or it was there some element of the folk music you were playing and listening to that you also find in north indian classical music um i i think uh the the folk music that i was listening to um uh, even the rock music and um i th- i think had a sort of hmm melodic unresolved sound which which created sort of trance like moods yeah um so i'm i'm thinking in rock music of of course psychedelia which is kind of misleading word it immediately makes you think of rainbow colors and 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 drugs but uh, musically speaking uh, psychedelia can create a, a, a harmonic and melodic trance like mood through a uh, use of kind of sounds and 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 various sorts of notes uh maybe chromatic notes sometimes which in another context would be identified with stress or anxiety but in yeah. psychedelia is not uh w- with with the folk music um there there were these you know uh, uh, sus fourth uh, chords add ninth chords yeah which 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 are quite different from uh, i mean th- there is a connection to the blues in in folk music but it's different from the the seventh chords yeah 
uh, which which are used, you know, traditionally in the blues. Uh, it, it has a different sense of melodic irresolution, suspension, uh, which which creates this kind of stasis and trance-like kind of uh, state. I think I was drawn to that uh, um, in a similar way to the way that I was drawn to the Indian music for this did, sense of, of possibility within stasis. Did you hear that irresolution in the voices as well? In, in Joni Mitchell's voice, in Neil Young's voice, that sense of it's not exactly happy, it's not exactly sad, you know, it's... it's... I think that's a very nice way of putting it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, at first, I mean, when you listen to early Joni Mitchell, and if you're not used to her, then uh, you just think she's another folk singer singing in, the, this, in this tremulous voice. But then when you actually listen to what she's doing, if you listen to uh, Judy Collins singing both sides now, and uh, uh, then you realize that, no, that, that is the tremulous singing, but you go, go, to, go to Joni Mitchell's cover which, of her own song, <laughs> basically, mm -hmm. a, a cover of her original. I call it a cover of the original because I think Judy Collins uh, uh, re uh, released her version prior to Joni Mitchell's, right? If I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so it, 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 it's as if Joni Mitchell is kind of singing her own songs after the fact. Yeah. Uh, and, and she brings to it this, this, this amazing sense of, she just plays it with the acoustic guitar, it's just her and the acoustic guitar, but she brings to it this sense of <sighs> hypnosis, uh, uh, irresolution that you're talking about, neither happy nor sad, um, which is fascinating. It's not just tremulous self-expression, which, which is what we somehow think folk music conventionally is. Mm -hmm. But these singers, Neil Young, um, Joni Mitchell, make it something different. Time's moving so fast. I wonder if you want to read a little bit of the book that deals with your, your earlier life or the, yeah. the, the period of time when you were coming toward classical music. And then you also had a, a, another song you wanted to play before questions. Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm reading this bit which in which I'm sort of... Um, going to read about my about what we were talking about just now my my introduction to indian classical music until 1977 when i finished school i wanted to be a pop then a rock musician my parents probably thinking i'd become a chartered accountant allowed me this fantasy my father an extraordinarily kind man sponsored my enthusiasms as a result, I possessed a Yamaha acoustic guitar with a sweet, expansive sound and an Ibanez, both procured from Denmark Street on trips to London. In 1978, I left school and my anomalous side found play. I turned into a quasi-modernist. I wrote imitations of Beckett's early incomprehensible English poems, themselves imitations of Eliot. I grew my hair to a length of my choosing. I entered junior college in Elphinstone College and pretended I was a BA student. I gave off the vibes of a drug addict without having touched an illegal substance. I made progress on the guitar very fast and started writing songs when I was 16. From a pop rock singer, I transformed that year to a Canadian singer-songwriter in the making. The, po uh, the points of entry came then. So I'm talking about how I then, at the same time, got into Indian classical music. So I won't read all of it, I'm just talking about the first point of entry over here. The points of entry came them, then. They formed a small cluster. Maybe it's in their nature to seem like a constellation, in retrospect, when one is related to the other. The first was my music teacher's arrival in my life. He wasn't my music teacher then, he was my mother's. He was very young, I realize that now, maybe 34. He wore a white kurta and pajamas. 
His name was Govind Prasad Jaipur Wale. My mother had a long list of music teachers in Bombay. However talented they may have been, they were a part of my mother's world, not mine. I mean, I wasn't interested in them except as characters in her world, which served as an exotic counterpoint to mine. Govind Ji, as we called him, was the first of her teachers to access my world. At 16, I was ready. I first heard about him in a conversation a lyricist called Rajesh Johari had with my mother on the balcony of the flat in Malabar Hill. My mother felt her teacher at the time had nothing more to offer her. She and her teachers tired of each other periodically. Rajesh Johari let drop that surname Jaipur Wale, literally of Jaipur. It was already known to my mother, not to me, from his father Lakshman Prasad Jaipurwali's reputation as a teacher. How good is he, asked my mother, about the son. Lakshman Prasad had by then passed on. Is he better than X, she said, referring to her present teacher, a perfectly good singer with not unusually alcohol-related problems. Better, said Rajesh Johari, X hasn't been born in comparison. Wo uske samne peda bhi nahi hua. I remember my mother was amused by this recommendation. She repeated it to my father in Rajesh Johari's voice. She was an excellent mimic. And Govindji became her teacher. I was struck by how beautiful his voice was, that unlike many teachers of classical music whose voice wasn't necessarily their strong point, he could sing the so-called light forms like the bhajans or devotionals my mother wanted to learn from him with quiet, blissful conviction. Just as pure classical music was met with bewilderment and sometimes mocked by those who listened to the simpler forms, the simpler forms were slightly looked down upon by the classical world. I use the present tense because classical music is now so peripheral to the consciousness that what I have described no longer constitutes a debate or misunderstanding. Nevertheless, I got the sense that Govindji was walking a tightrope and singing so many forms with such ease, that ease was suspect and that too much melodiousness risked not being given proper seriousness. He was a great pleasure to listen to, the tone of his voice and a mastery that made you believe that he could do anything he, with it he chose to. He sang softly without insistence and almost never sang the same phrase twice. His aim achieved with modesty was to surprise and be surprised. I wanted to do what he was doing. This was odd as I'd been content till then to sing songs with my guitar. But there was something contagious, arresting and disruptive of the flow of time about being able to produce consecutively two or three versions of a phrase, each with a marginally different emotional impact, each new thought revising the previous one. I tried to do it when I was alone and stumbled. Clearly, you couldn't produ produce these modulations just because you wanted to. One of the so things this... Uh, yeah. one, I was going to say, one of the things this book did for me, the many things this book did for me, was it introduced me to the recordings made by your mother, right. Joya Chattery, who was a great singer. Yes. Um, um, and I wonder what it was like to listen to her so much, to listen to her singing as much as you must have done. Uh, to listen to her so much meant that you, uh, I, 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 I never so, sort of really listened to her, uh, you know? Yeah. I mean, uh, it meant not to kind of uh, completely uh, um, be fully aware of, um, just what an extraordinary singer she was um, and yet it was to be because we have we had similar musical temperaments it was to sort of to accept that she was a benchmark in some way um, and, 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 and so I had so I, I had these benchmarks in Indian music there was my mother and there was Govind Prasad Jaipur Wale my, my, my teacher it mean that it, 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 it meant that I I, I kind of easily bored or didn't take to uh, a, a lot of other singing which other people did because the benchmark was quite high as you would have found out from 
the recordings of my mother, the texture of the voice, the tonality. Yeah. Well, if we have enough time, I wonder if you'd if you'd want to sing one of those earlier songs that you wrote. Yeah. And then we can have uh, some questions. Is, sure. This is the, a song which I wrote in, I think, 1981, so when I was 19. And I really haven't played it since then. I've been trying to practice the guitar uh, in order to be able to sing it for you. It might be a disaster. Um, all this is an experiment, but, um, you know, I'm um, going to give it a shot. Just don't take it too seriously. Um, all these songs, I have about 10 of them in recorded form because I sang them on the radio between 1978 and 1982. I wondered I about that. England. Yeah. I wondered about that because it's, it's on so I think your, you've heard one a, a version from 1981. It's on radio your YouTube broadcast. channel and it sounded as if a radio announcer was, imp was introducing you. Right. So I'm, I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, release a compilation of those uh, um, radio recordings quite soon. So this will be on, on that compilation. So this is called uh, Shame. The song is called Shame. I, I, I think I've, I'm calling the album 17 to signify um, an age when you experience so much uh, in a kind of make-believe world, in terms of pain, desolation, love, unrequited love. Uh, so much seems real to you, at least did to me. This was the time when I was uh, isolated myself, was doing Indian classical music, um, and was really writing these songs just for the radio broadcasts and for myself. Let me see if I can just situate myself in a way. <clears throat> See how it goes. Excuse me. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. Take your time. Shame, as I said. So I'm sure it sounds like there's some kind of some buildings falling down or something like that. One day you left me alone I found the lies you had said I felt that I wasn't there You made me feel I was dead You know I loved you like me I thought that your love was true But in return you made me ashamed of loving you You made me what I am but you left me the blame How was I to know You'd bring me shame I lie awake through the night I know you too are alone I know the grief you brought me was really your own You made me what I am, baby You left me empty and blue And in the end when you went you made me someone like you 
Ah, whoever you were, baby, don't leave me pleasure or pain. All that you left me was shame. Da 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 Oh, that was great. Thank you. Al, do you think that we have time for questions? Yes, let's, uh, we'll, let, we'll take a couple. We've got some really good ones that I wanna get through um, and then we can call it an evening. That was, that was tremendous. We, we should be doing, uh, Amit should just be playing at all of our events, honestly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll work it out later. We'll, we'll, we'll send you some, some drugs to stay up all night. Um, Sergeant Peppers, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so I'm gonna start with this question. Um, uh, this is from a Brian Collins. Thanks for this, Professor Chowdhury. I've spent 20 years studying South Asian religions, language, cultures, and history, but Indian classical music of the North and the South has always eluded me. There are plenty of accessible histories of Western music written from non-musicologists, but I have never found anything equivalent for Indian music. Uh, maybe there isn't anything like that, but I'm hoping there is. Um... There, I, I think that there, there might be things in, in, in some of the Indian languages in Hindi. I've heard that there, 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 there are some interesting, uh, and in Bengali. But, but you're right. I mean, in the English language, there isn't very much. Uh, and um, I don't know if this book... Is, it, this book is not meant to remedy that situation. But it, it, it is definitely a kind of response to the fact that um, one wishes that a different kind of conversation was possible about this music, uh, and and it, it's written not to fill a gap, not at all, but to create a different kind of conversation uh, from the one that I hear. So I don't know if whether Ben thinks that this might kind of make a bit of sense to a, you know. Uh, a lay listener or, or somebody who's just trying to explore the, uh, the, the, the area for the first time. Hmm. Um, a, a next question. This one's a little bit more theoretical, but I am interested in it. W when you started talking at the beginning, you called it exploring the Raj. When you, when you were talking about performing, uh, is it a sense of exploration when you're improvising? Um, or how do you conceptualize your own movement through the music? It is it is exploration because uh, you know um, the 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 composition uh, in which the rag is and the rag itself is a, uh, the, so the rag itself is a kind of series of notes um, which ascends in a particular manner and uh, ascends also accompanied by many descents so it doesn't just ascend it goes up comes down a little bit and then goes up again uh, and um, and 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 the exploration is to it, the, the the kind of aim of the exploration is to magnify the details of 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 this ascending rag and then its descent which also it will also descend in a manner peculiar to that particular rag uh, Within within these peculiarities and within the ascent and descent, uh, the form of the khayal reveals to us is this huge potential for exploration, for 
of a meditation on each one of these details to do with the ascent, which can also be uh, mm, approached uh, each time from slightly different perspectives. Of course, you cannot uh, um, depart the rules of the ascent, which makes it that, or descent, which makes it that particular rag and not another one. Mm. But slowed down, it has the it has the ability to sort of uh, um, be imaginatively inquired into, rewritten, rethought uh, in a way that one wouldn't have thought possible. So uh, the, the notes of a rag, uh, once a composition is set to a rag, you know, it, you, you, you could sing it in, in a minute, or in two minutes. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but the fact is that one can, uh, through delays, through, through multiple kind of approaches, uh, uh, amplify, magnify this exploration in a way that one wouldn't have thought previously possible. This exploration is what is happening in Indian classical music when you listen to it. This exploration is what happened to it more and more from the 30s onwards in a kind of radical intellectual modernist move which opened it up even further in the khayal but also in other uh, uh, other forms of Indian classical music like in, the in, in instrumental music. There, there has been an opening up uh, to exploration that stretches um, uh, the recognizable form of what we would understand a composition as song, opens it up in a way that is radical. That links to uh, another great question that we got. Can you talk about the relationship you see between improvisational music and modernism and literature, and perhaps tradition and authority in Indian music and how they might be similar to writing fiction? So uh, I have spent quite a bit of time in the book uh, discussing the modernism of the Khayal, connecting it to what I uh, know of modernism, uh, um, including all forms of art that are by the end of the 19th century beginning to sort of move away from uh, conventional representation through which you can um, identify two things. Let's say if you take a, take a painting, you can, you can identify first, first and foremost. You identify what the painting is about. It's a painting of a, of of a, of a landscape or a tree or a peep or, 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 or a group of people sitting under a tree. Uh, and and through that you can also, of course, uh, identify the form that this is a painting. This is a proper painting. Uh, when by the time the impressionists and post-impressionists begin to work, they are unshackling themselves from the obligation to represent in, in this particular way for, because of compulsions of their own. Um, and, and those two things then go out of the window. This doesn't look like a tree. This, those don't look like people, according to the first viewers, the first critics of those paintings. And secondly, this doesn't look like a painting. It's not a painting. What is this? So, so uh, uh, this this kind of um, shaking of the fetters of, of of what it is that marks something out for being what it is, and then being liberated from that into into new possibilities is happening in let's say I've, I've, since I mentioned painting is happening in in painting uh, by the end of the, of the 19th century. Why? I mean, because because. Uh, a, a Renaissance art, neoclassicism, everything that represents things f full on is, is seeming constraining and boring. It is fundamentally, for me, boring. And these artists are becoming uh, 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 exposed by the late 18th century through the 19th century to, to non-representational forms, forms that approach representation in a different way from other parts of the world. They're, they're newly becoming uh, exposed to different, powerful, non-representational cultures. And, 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 and 
artists, whether they're from Europe or from other parts of the world, are responding to this time of of contact, and 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 this is creating a, a kind of liberation in terms of liberation from representation. Uh, this is where I would also place the khayal and what's happening to music, to to this um, uh, to this willingness to free oneself from whatever it is that conventionally identifies it for being what it is, whether it's a painting or a musical composition or a song. So that sounds like a song, but what is that? Is that a song? I mean, what, what's he up to? Remember that, that the, the kind of puzzlement you feel when you listen to Khayal is also felt by most Indians. And, and, and they feel, well, what is going on over there? That, that's not like the songs we usually hear. This is because of, of the changes that happened uh, uh, through time, not immemorial time. It, maybe the changes happened s uh, slowly over the centuries, but they accelerated in the 20th century. Um, that, that, that made kind of artists able to go beyond uh, the security of the identifiable. So there was something in the question about authority which I may, ha may not have answered. But I'm, what I'm trying to do here is place everything I know and everything I'm drawn to as a writer and as a musician, as a composer, uh, uh, in cinema, art, music, writing. I'm trying to place this music within that because it seems to have its full beauty for me because it's part of this particular sort of unshackling that I'm talking about here and which I use, for which I use as shorthand, the word modernism. Right. Well, I mean, now that we have you getting up earlier, you'll be able to do a lot more things. So, um, <laughs> and then <laughs> we're going to take one last question. And this I'm also very fascinated by. Um, uh, if you were to recommend a gateway recording uh, into the world of, of you know, Indian classical, contemporary classical, something that you find seductive to a new listener, um, what would you, what would you do? Hmm. Start with, with the shorter recordings I mentioned, the 78 RPM recordings where somebody would sing a khayal in three minutes. Start with them, start with a singer like D.V. Paluskar, um, I think you like his voice. Um, Kishori Amonkar was was one of those singers who kind of uh, um, made me make that turn towards this music. When I heard her when I was 16, uh, I think just something about the tonality of her voice would 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 maybe make you listen. Once you start listening. Then you begin inquiring and you want to find out more mm -hmm. about why it seems beautiful to you. So, uh, Kishori Amonkar, you know, Rag, um, Pat Bihag, or Rag Bageshri, the early studio recordings. And then you can move to the, to, to, to the private live recordings, or many of which are now available on YouTube in a way that they certainly weren't when I was growing up. One thing that we might be able to do too is um, we can talk after the event and maybe I can get a playlist right up for you and we can put it on the YouTube. Oh, good, video. good. Yes, that's a great idea. Um, I want sure. it for myself and I might as well share it with everyone. So, that's fine. Okay, um, good. Otherwise, uh, uh, thank you. This this was a real treat. This is our first uh, our first spot of, of live music on these recordings. So um, thank you so much for, for joining us so thank early you. in the day. Um, ben, thank you so much for the for the fantastic questions. And uh, thanks, other, Hal. I wish we could just keep going, but alas. Pleasure talking to you, Ahmed. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It was it was great. And uh, Ahmed, I'll see you next year on you know year three of the pandemic. We'll do another event, I guess. So <laughs> every year, once once a year. So absolutely, it keeps going on, and and this will keep going on. No, yeah. no, we'll see each other in person next time. We must. We must. Yeah. All right, everyone. Good night. Be well. Good night. Bye.